I can tell you myself as one uh, moderate conservative Democrat with many other moderates want to sit down and work with our moderate Republican friends to fix uh, and repair the uh, Affordable Care Act. My hope is we don't say we'll come back and see you in two weeks. Let's go to work on some ideas that are good ideas, they're good ideas. Obviously, I'm a pretty progressive Democrat, but I would sit down with them in a heartbeat. They don't have the license to do that from Mitch McConnell. We are willing to debate and compromise on health care, but we have to be included. President Trump, my Republican friends, the choice is yours. Joining us now from Washington, one of the Republicans opposing the current version of the Senate health care bill, Senator Shelley Moore Capito of West Virginia. Thank you very much for being on the show this morning. Shelley, My pleasure. It, thank you. It's always great talking to you. We were we had somebody on and others have suggested there can be a little bit of tweaking of this bill and maybe pull people like yourself and Rob Portman over. But how do you ever get, and I say this as a conservative, yeah. but how do you ever get there? Uh, representing a state that would be devastated by these cuts to Medicaid. Well, that's been my source of concern, Joe. I, I'm very concerned about the Medicaid portion and what it would do to a state like mine. We have the largest per capita population that's in the Medicaid program. We have It is a wonderful safety net for so many of our West Virginians. At the same time, I think reform is needed in the program to make the dollars go farther and more efficiently. I think we would, you know, health professionals and everybody would agree with that. So I think it's threading a needle. And uh, you know, you've been behind the scenes trying to figure it out. We were on the House side together, and the Senate, you know, your margins are so much narrower. So we're very, I am very passionate about how I feel, and conservatives on the other side uh, are pushing their issues, and so far there hasn't been too much give because I'm not willing to go back home and say this program is not going to work for you, but I'm still going to go for it do anyway. You, do I, you think that the president uh, um, is engaged and understands the, the plan that uh, you're being asked to push? You know what, I think the president understands that uh, many parts of Obamacare are broken and we need to fix it. And I think he also, in the meeting, uh, I thought he did a nice job listening to everybody and, and imploring us. He really did say more than a few times, put some more money into this, which obviously helps the safety net, helps the lower income, and helps folks like I'm concerned with who have the opioid crisis. The president is definitely engaged. Uh, and I think, you know, I just talked to him again yesterday. So I think he's working the phones pretty well. So, Senator, 10.5% of the people in your state are on Medicaid. Kentucky's not far behind, Senator McConnell's state. Uh, the opioid abuse problem in, in your state and, and many, many other states yes. is catastrophic. Don't you think in retrospect it would have been a better idea to go about approaching this issue, to have public hearings, rather than to have done it so much of it behind closed doors? Why did you know, that I happen? You know, I think we've talked about it so much in terms of the last seven years in terms of what's going wrong with the program. I mean, you know, I, I don't have an opposition to public hearings, but I think in, in order to, you can see how difficult it's been just with the only public document that's come out last week to try to weave the balance. And I think uh, Leader McConnell really has worked with all of us in a very open forum to try to figure out, and all of us, I mean Republicans, yeah. uh, all of us, to try to figure out the best way or the, the <laughs> pressure points that we feel. Uh, and so I think, uh, you know, now we see where we are. We're sort of at a stalemate right now that's trying to be uh, broken through. Whether that can be done, uh, I think we'll find out tomorrow. Hey, Senator, it's mm -hmm. Willie Geis. It's good to Hi, see Willie. you this morning. Um, Thank so you. We've talked a lot about the politics of this and how you're going to get it done. We've seen a lot of statistics. But I want to ask you about the human toll you think this might take. You're asking for $45 billion worth of spending on the opioid crisis. Currently, the bill suggests $2 billion. What would happen in your state if it were only $2 billion? And what would happen in your state if the Medicaid expansion were rolled back over time? When you talk to people, what are they most worried about in West Virginia? Well, at the core of it is the opioid and the mental health piece. Uh, you know, $2 billion obviously is very inefficient, and that was one of the things that drove me to voice my opposition. Uh, I think, but I, you know, I have the Medicaid piece is probably the larger piece. I think Mike said that 10 percent, I thought I heard, it's actually 30 percent of West Virginia is on some kind of Medicaid. And, and so this, this, these. Right, and, uh, and the, the 10 percent is the Medicaid expansion. Expansion, yeah. right. right. Okay, so that's about 180,000. That's absolutely correct. Right. We need to find a way to 
either keep Medicaid expansion, give the states the options, give the states the flexibility to build in better programs, or to have folks who are in that expansion population be able to afford uh, with tax credits and other supplements to be able to afford. And that's where the opioid money comes in, and that's where I think it would be important for um, my population, which is really reeling. So and if Senator, people around the country don't think they're going to get it, it's coming to their state. So, Senator, what happens, just as a practical human matter, to someone who's on Medicaid and has it taken away in your state, if this bill became law, what would happen to those people? You know, that's my concern. I, I'm not dropping them off a cliff. I didn't come here to hurt people. I came here to help them. And so I'm pushing for, you know, a, a longer glide path. And also, when that person, you know, a, a, a better case scenario is to have somebody on a private insurance plan that they can manage themselves. But if it's unaffordable, they're not going to do it. Right, right. And so, and so let's get that where it's instead of this, we're, we're right there together and the states can formulate that. I think it can be done, but it's not done in this bill. Hey, Senator, I, we, we've been trying to explain uh, over the past week, just for any Republicans out there, you think that Medicaid just impacts the poorest among us. I've been trying to explain how Medicaid cuts would be devastating in my district to the four or five hospitals, uh, to right. uh, not only indig homes. indigent care, but nursing homes, yes. uh, people that are suffering with Alzheimer's. Uh, can you explain that part of it just for conservatives and Republicans that may think this only impacts the poor in states like West Virginia? Can you explain how Medicaid cuts on this scale impact not only the hospitals in your states, but hospitals all across America, especially in middle America? Well, and particularly in rural America. And, and I think that Medicaid is a, a major payer for a lot of our hospitals, our small rural hospitals that are the only uh, point at which folks can get care uh, anywhere close to where they live. Uh, also, nursing homes. Medicaid has a portion of it that goes to the aged, which when people, 70% of our nursing homes in West Virginia are Medicaid patients, children, disabled. That, those folks, this, uh, this bill has reform in all through the Medicaid program. I want to make sure that the safety net that Medicaid is, is preserved. And I don't think that's an unrepublican idea. No, no. Not at all. Uh, just curious, you said the president's engaged and he's even spoken to you several times about it. What has he said? What is he hoping that you will do? Well, obviously he hopes I'll vote for the bill and he's but trying to be persuasive. Do you think he but un understands what's in it? You know, I think he understands the, the broader concept of fixing the exchanges. And a, as you know, it's very complicated. Uh, he doesn't engage in the minutia of the details. And, you know, that's fine. I think, you know, he's, uh, I, I've actually thought he was very good in the meeting two days ago, trying to listen so he could hear why it hasn't moved this far and where the different uh, thought paths are within our own conference. It, and so, you know, I, I, I think that with his leadership will be very helpful. Will it pull it over the edge? It'll help. But in the end, we're going to vote with our hearts from our own state. And that's what I intend to do. Yeah. Senator Shelley Moore Capito, thank you very much for being on the show this morning. Thanks so much. Thanks. And just ahead this hour, we're going to bring in uh, Senator Capito's Democratic counterpart. Senator Joe Manchin will be our guest. Also ahead, Homeland Security has announced new screening protocols for international flights. A laptop ban is off the table for now, but officials are enhancing security measures. Tom Costello joins us live next with the details. They did change the part, Willie, though, where you're not allowed to wear pants on international flights. Thank okay. God. Oh. Oh, that would have been on They want you to wear the yoga I pants, though. No, I got yoga. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube. And make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. And you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.